Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Barry Erickson and I'm Community Engagement Coordinator at Wheaton Public Library. Throughout the year, we partner with the DuPage Art League to bring you these art demonstrations. Founded 63 years ago, the DuPage Art League is committed to the arts in bringing enriching programming to art lovers throughout our community. Located on Front Street in downtown Wheaton, the DuPage Art League is both a school and gallery. They are dedicated to promoting and encouraging the visual arts through classes, workshops, gallery exhibits, and free public fine arts programs. Their classes and workshops cover a wide range of mediums and are designed for all ages. The beautiful storefront gallery and gift shop are open to the public. We are grateful to the DuPage Art League for arranging tonight's demonstration. Watercolor artist Michael Ireland's fascination with the effects of light and color through transparent watercolor began over 45 years ago at the American Academy of Art in Chicago. Today, Michael is a nationally recognized painter, as well as an accomplished creative director and graphic designer. Michael's painting style and tech challenges traditional scale and format, resulting up to 20 feet in length. His artwork is part of public and private collections throughout the country. Most recently, Michael was selected by the Hudson Valley Art Association for their 88th annual juried exposition taking place this summer in Connecticut. So congratulations on that honor, Michael, and we are anxious to turn the screen over to you. Okay, well, well thank you very much, uh, Barry, and uh, welcome everybody to Cary, to my, uh, to my studio, to my gallery. Um, it's uh, wonderful to have everybody here. Uh, working with me tonight is my, my wife, my partner, uh, Mary. So uh, say hi, Mary. Hi. And uh, hopefully we're going to uh, have a little fun tonight and uh, enjoy some conversation between, uh, between all of us. Um, real quick about the American Academy of Art. Uh, many of you probably heard the news. Richard Schmidt uh, passed away. Uh, today or last night, I guess, uh, who was a graduate of the American Academy of Art. And uh, just the tip of the hat to the guy because uh, probably one of the finest painters in our lifetime, uh, teacher, wonderful painter, uh, friend to all. I didn't know him personally, but uh, uh, his reputation certainly preceded uh, the time that I spent at the American Academy. So. Uh, Here's to you, Richard. Hope you're painting wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, the synopsis for this uh, demo tonight uh, was a sketch is like uh, a roadmap to your wildest journey, which is kind of a romantic, uh, <laughs> a romantic way to look at it. Um, but uh, it is kind of true. Uh, and I think one of the things that should be interesting to most of us, or most of you, I hope, is that uh, we look at sketches in a couple of different ways, just like a uh, just like a journey or the roadmap, so to speak. Uh, that could be the paper atlas, uh, could be the GPS, or it could be pulling along the side of the road to the asking the farmer where you're going, and he'll say, "Well, it's where the old." McCutcheon's barn used to be. It's just down the road. So anything goes, you know, however you get there from here, uh, that's kind of the roadmap that we're taking today. Um, the value of the sketch, uh, pretty important stuff, I think. You know, I'm kind of, a, I've become kind of a wild, crazy, big wash of color painter, or that's how I'm perceived. But uh, I really do value the idea of the sketch and understanding what we're looking at, the observation. Uh, the nicest thing about it is the sketch gives you the opportunity to rid yourself of any mistakes uh, because it's a sketch, it's, it's free. Uh, you can actually, you know, you don't have to worry about getting lost because you just go for it and you do it and you learn things as you go along. It's an observation tool as much as anything. Um, it gives you the confidence of, you know, getting from here to there. It's, it's almost like back to the roadmap. 
you know, if you've driven off, let's say off to Door County and you've never been there, it's kind of wild. You don't know where you're going, but you go back the second time and you can tell that person that's driving with you, hey, I know where I'm going. I've been here before. I kind of have a lay of the land. And that lay of the land is that final painting uh, that you're going to, but it's that sketch that, that gets you there. So um, without further ado, uh, let's just talk about it and, and see how that works. Um, I'm going to stay fairly simple in this, uh, but and there's going to be a little bit of art 101 here. Let me fix this for us. Okay, so um, as unromantic as it seems, <laughs> this is our subject today. <laughs> but it's, it's very simple and it, it should be that way. So, you know, the, the nice thing, and I actually have to look at it here because I want to see the camera view that you're seeing, but the thing about the sketch is you just go for it. You don't even, you shouldn't even be lifting your, your pencil off the paper. Yeah, you're just working with this and it should be quick. This is not a drawing. This is an idea. This is a concept. You're trying to figure things out. So you get this in and it helps you understand your perspective, what you're looking at, how things are working, and then how it applies to, how it applies to painting. I like to look at it as you go right into what your first wash would be. In this case, it's going to be one big wash. And it's telling me that this particular area is my whitest, my lightest area. And that's, I think, what we're working on for the most part. We're trying to establish value. Really, you don't need to establish, in this respect, you don't need to establish any more value than your, your light, your medium, and your dark. Perhaps maybe, perhaps maybe a couple of medium values in there. And when I sketch, especially like this, as I refer to it, it is similar to a wash. This is pretty much how I would put my first color wash down. And there is going to be a little bit of tone in here. So if you think about it, what I did was I just took a big brush and put a wash down that covered this whole area. This kind of tells me this is going to be my first pass in a painting. I'm going to use a very soft, I think that's a 4B right now. Okay. So the nib wears down very quickly. I've got a couple of them. So that gives me the opportunity then to say, okay, what's my, what's my next value? Well, my next value is going to be this area right here. So what I'm going to do is everything except for that is going to get a shading. And as you can see, I'm not really working on a drawing right now. I'm just trying to work out the different values. And there's no right or wrong. The, the nice thing about this is yeah, there's no racer in this, by the way. You know, there, there's no need for that. You, know, you just, just let it go. And 
And this is pretty much how I would have attacked or approached a watercolor wash. This would be my second wash of value. And for my planning for going into the painting, it's not going to have to be anything much more than that. Now, what you can see is that oh, over here, um, this is going to be my darker area. So I've identified my light, my mediums, and then Then my darks. Now, as the painting goes on, obviously there's a there's a shadow play back here. But more or less, this has given me my three separate values: my light, my medium, my dark. And it tells me where my painting is going to go when I finally go to, to that place, okay? Um, now, I, I know a box is not the most romantic or exciting thing to do, but just to put this in context, to put this in context, it could be as simple as, um, here, uh, let's go like this. Let's put a roof on it. Okay, now, you know, what I've done we just we just figured out how the barn is constructed. And looking back, let's see, we'll go. There's a little painting in the back there. Um that's our well, let's see, we've got our We have our horizon line. Which is going to extend over here. And we even have our foliage. Which is right back there by the window. That little painting back there. Oh, you could, well, it's right, it's right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so we've already created you know, an object, and there you go. Now, obviously, this is going to be you know, refined as you move into the painting, but that's the whole idea of the value of the sketch. Right there, I have a plan. I have the idea of where I want to go with this, and... Um, Obviously, you can take this to a much more complex level, but that's not the point right now. The point is to understand, you know, at the very least, to understand your three sets of values and work from there. So, um, Michael, would this, would, would this, I'm sorry to interrupt, but would this be an okay time to move the camera in a little bit closer to take a look at that sketch? Sure. Or, or, or bring it forward. That works too. Yes. Okay. Does that work a little bit better for you? That's great. Thank you. And sure. could, could you tell us just one more time the materials you use, like the type of paper and the pencils that you were using to do the sketch? Sure. Well, well, this is just a standard watercolor paper. It's uh, um, kind of an off-brand, actually, um, but uh, it's, I would say, it's like a 140-pound uh, kind of hot press. And um, these are basically just, uh, uh, I don't even know the, the brand name of these. They're called the Fine Touch, but these are... Uh, different levels of, like this is a 7B, an 8B, uh, pretty soft lead, 4B. These are all soft, soft leads. 
So I get a much deeper, darker uh, lead as opposed to, you know, going into the twos and the, you know, or the HBs, the hard lead. Um, but the point I was trying to make there too, is that the one thing you don't want to do is confuse the idea of, do I have that please? Mm -hmm. um, the idea of a sketch being a drawing. You don't want to get all hung up in it. Like I said, there's no, we can put that up there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. The idea being that this is a sketch as opposed to a drawing. This is hours of work of painstaking, you know, not painstaking work, but you know, observation and looking and you know, erasing different parts and you know, working on form and shape and and you know, there's more subtle areas of of drawing, trying to figure out. Sure, we can do that. So we can really see it well. I, I can hold it, sweetie. Here, why don't we do this? So, so this is definitely a drawing, which is essentially in a category of itself, like painting and oils and watercolors or any other, you know, pastels. And I consider this being in a category, whereas the sketch is a sketch, and that's all that is. Um, what we can do, too, and one of the things I... I uh, I talked about the, the GPS or the, you know, getting the atlas or talking to the farmer for directions. Um, there's a lot of different ways to, you know, work with sketches. Um, the pencil sketch, obviously, you know, and this is certainly great for in the field, but we can also do this. Well, I'm going to need this. Oh, you're going to need this. Like yes. this, if you don't mind. And what we'll do. Can we hold that one for this? Um, yeah. Okay. okay. What we're gonna do is pull this and we're gonna turn the camera down so we can see this more. Um, the same idea. I'm gonna go back to that. That box so that we're going to take the lessons that we learned I'm going to take the lessons that we learned from the pencil drawing and see how that applies to watercolor. So you can do the same thing in the respect that we're going to keep that that white white and lay down that that very early simple first layer of value, okay? We'll let that dry for just a second here. And um, while we do that, I'm gonna take you to another thought of sketches. Uh, no, but let's go with these guys. So, you know, wh whether it's a pencil or whether it's a marker or Conti crayon or whatever, once again, you're in the process of trying to find, you know, either the value or the emotion, the energy. In this case, I was really intrigued by this shape. Um, as simple as it is, it presents a number of different 
issues to try to figure out how it works and what the, in this case, I was actually trying to figure out what the energy was. And I didn't go with a normal traditional, you know, I didn't try to sketch this line by line. What I really wanted to do was find how the energy worked and what the shading would be like. So, so this was really just working out over and over, really just a contour line drawing, just, you know, gesture drawing. If anybody ever took life drawing in, in school, you know, the gesture drawing where you never take your pencil off the, off the paper, you just keep on drawing and working and working and working. And it was this that helped me find the energy that I was looking for in this. And that was the most important part to me. Um, now, kind of fun, what I've got a mirror image here, so I'm going backwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, what this turned out to be, got you got that? I got it. Was, there you go, great. Was this piece over here? And I think it held the same energy as, as this, but I was able to start capturing the shape, the value. No, that's, that's fine. It's okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, the shape, the value, and, and then start working out, you know, the shapes of the negative spaces inside there too. But the very first thing I wanted to do was capture, capture this. So this gave me the understanding of where I wanted to go with, with this piece. Now you can see these are, oh, maybe what, four by four, five by five inch mm -hmm. type of pieces, you know? And this turned out to be, I know the whole piece is 48 frame to 48 high. So, you know, about a 40 by 40, let's say, um, which, you know, I would never have approached this just on its own without ever going through this process. This gave me the idea, this gave me the thought, this gave me the idea of where the energy lied and even looking into, you know, how the shape of the sphere is. You can see that I worked in a little bit more darker in here, which was reflected in here and we can create more of a, a three-dimensional piece. Uh, so it became, you know, pretty much, well, I can't say it became what I wanted it to become because I wasn't sure until I got there, but this was the great starting point for me. So, um, you know, and if anybody has any questions, uh, you know, about any of this at the moment, uh, feel free to, you know, jump in here. I'm going to turn this up a little bit. Uh, Michael, there aren't any questions yet, but this is a great time to to remind people that if you'd like to enter a question, please look along the bottom edge of your Zoom screen and open up that icon that says Q&A. It will open up a separate small window that you can move off to the side so you're sure to be able to see everything that Michael's doing there. But that will give you an opportunity to enter your questions. Okay, great, great, thanks. Um, this isn't fully dry at the moment, but I'm not going to worry about it too much. Um, just so you know, I am, you know, yes about paint and, uh, or yes about materials. I'm working in, uh, I'm working with just our good old friend Payne's Gray here. Um, so what, and the nice thing is it just stays with one kind of color. And once again, just like in the pencil drawing, we're going to cut this out. And develop that second level. Okay. And already I'm working too hard on it. Um, 
So that, that gets us to there. Um, the nice thing about this is it really does start to play into your the need that you have to start understanding how your washes are working. And as you can see too, I didn't, uh, I didn't want to just like paint a section over a section, you know, like that. I want to cover the whole thing and, and use the whole wash to start to find, to define that, that whole area. Um, and we're going to let this, dry for a sec. Um, and what we're going to do is go back to, I, I've got a little notepad here. I'm sorry. I'm moving in too quickly here. Um, one, okay, so we're going to do this in a in a variety of colors first, but one of the things I wanted to point out real quick was um, if you could show, let me this? see the color mm -hmm. chart. Sure, here I'll take that. Uh, I got it. It's it's okay. fine. Um, one of the things I do quite often is, especially if I start getting stuck in some places is I'll create a color chart. And I've become a very big fan of triads, uh, especially in this kind of a situation where I'm trying to figure things out. This is essentially a very, this is a warm triad. And this is uh, ultramarine, uh, pyrrol crimson, and uh, uh, quinochrome gold. Uh, and I just create, you know, a color chart with this. This is a cool color chart with phthalo blue and quinchrome uh, crimson and Hansa yellow. And then this is a very, I love this palette, actually. It's more of a earth tone organic um, that has a chromium blue cerulean uh, along with an Indian red, and what was this other was, oh, Gertha, excuse me for a second, a Gertite, it's kind of a brown umber, so to speak. Um, but I'll do this on a, many occasions, just trying to figure out how these are working and how I'm going to break down my subjects. Um, Working with triads, it gives you a, such a nice opportunity to not have to make as many decisions about color. Uh, and you can start just working with, with value. So I'm going to just tilt this up a little bit. And so you can see a lot of times when I look for a piece of work or uh, an image to create, I look for the design as much as I look for anything else, knowing that I could put in any color I want. In this case, I used a, I used a triad just to start building this. And this is really about a, oh, a eight inch by eight inch type of a uh, sketch. But it was the basis to build on that started to give me what I wanted from this particular piece. Uh, the nice thing about that, the the thing about, oh, here, I can, I can okay. just hold this up. Okay. The thing about using the, uh, the palette and, and coming up with your color chart, it gives you the opportunity, say, you know, you look at a, at a piece and you say, well, you know, that evokes that, that warm earthen feel or it's that cool morning or that, that hot summer day. And I, I think it's really great to understand what the whole atmosphere looks like. Um, I was out in the back over there in the, in the woods today. And if, if you really look 
there is there is a dominant color. There's a dominant feel, a, a warmth or a coolness. So pick your colors appropriately and use those colors as your as your wash to help create that that mood, that feeling, and uh, and things like that. So. Could, could we interrupt for another question or two here, Michael? Sure. Uh, someone is asking, uh, I believe it's about the, the last uh, image that you showed uh, where there was a mostly almost black and white image or photograph and then the very colorful painting. Uh, were those the final colors that you used in, in the painting in that piece? It was very, it's very close. Um, you know, I, I stay within a triad here, but I, I'm, if I remember right, and, and this painting's, uh, this painting's long gone about, about a year ago. Uh, but I did add some more accent colors in there. I think there are a couple of, a couple of oranges that, that peaked through here that got reflected back into the water here. Just to give it that extra, that punch. Maybe I picked up a little complimentary color, uh, as I remember. Um, which <laughs> my my daughter's home from college uh, for the weekend. Uh, it reminded me of when she was a young girl. I, I'd always say, "Oh, we need that little extra punch of color." And she's like, does that mean I could put an orange dot in there? And, and you know, so I said, well, yeah, there is a little orange wash back there. And if you put that orange dot up there. Now, the funny thing about that, and I don't know if it's a trick or not, but I remember going to a Winslow Homer exhibition at, uh, at the Art Institute. And the gentleman I was with, a great guy by the name of Jim Caddy, was an old friend of mine. We stood in front of a number of Winslow Homer paintings, and sure enough, there would be a wash of real grayed out orange or you know a pink back there. But then you would see this dynamic, like little dot right next to the boat or something, or right on the shore. We're like, we know exactly what he's doing. He's pulling that color. And he's taking it right over there. You're going to go right across the sea and you're going to go right up to the beach, uh, which I thought was just tremendous. So yes, I would say to my, at the time, seven-year-old girl, yes, of course you could put an orange out there. <laughs> Great, thank you. And a couple of people are wondering what brand of watercolors you prefer. Nine times out of 10, um, I work with uh, Windsor Newton Professional Colors. Um, it's a real standard, you know, it's, uh, it's a go-to for me. It's what I, what I started with, but I'm very attracted to uh, the Daniel Smith collection as well. Uh, they have some very unique colors uh, that, uh, I mean, just are unmixable in any other, any other way. Uh, and some of the stuff that comes out of the tube is just, uh, yeah, it's uh, heart stopping for me. You know, for a, it's a pretty nerdy thing to say, but uh, you know, you see some of these things, and it's just, uh, it's great, and it, it can change the way you paint. I think so. It, I, I vacillate nine times out of ten. I will use uh, Windsor Newton, but. Uh, on occasion, when it calls for it, I'll go to a Daniel Smith uh, palette. And I, I do try to keep those two separate. Um, I mean, I guess sometimes when I'm, uh, when I need a color from another brand, I'll, I will mix them, but I do try to keep my butcher trays separate with Windsor Newton and this palette or in this tray and, you know, Daniel Smith and another, it just seems seems the, like it's the right thing to do. <laughs> Great, thank you. And maybe just uh, one more question during this pause. Uh, when you choose those main colors, like the triads you were showing us, how, how do you choose those particular colors? You know, it's kind of funny. Um, I, I actually lean more to it's, uh, Daniel Smith actually is the one that I kind of, 
they're kind of my go-to to realize what uh, what I want to use. They have a series of triads, um, kind of not pre-made but pre-selected, which are just just wonderful and and. Uh, I have no problem in following their formulas or, or some of the, the colors that come together. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I have no problem in just, you know, mix it up my own and just seeing what works, you know, how a, how a cool yellow will work against a warm, you know, a nice warm red and uh, vice versa. So um, I think I showed you that, yeah, I, I showed you that color chart. Uh, and here, just back again. Uh, this is this is kind of you know large and probably not as necessary. But I was using a big one or two inch brush on this. Uh, it's not uncommon for me prior to going into the actual painting to do a small, you know, a small color chart like this, or just see how how some of the paintings work. Uh, it kind of it kind of depends on what I'm working on at the time. Um, this is probably dry enough at the for this stage to just get us back to um, back to the box for a second. I'm just gonna take a shot at seeing that. Okay, and. Uh, I'm going to pick this out. Paper is a little wet, so I'm getting some waves in there. But it's actually a barn that's starting to wobble and get old right there. Yeah. <laughs> But you can see how this works now. It's just um, three passes. I've already established. What I need to establish to create form and space. And uh, there's my horizon line. Right there. Like that. Um, so basically, the whole idea being, you know, we have the pencil sketch that works, but then, you know, we can go right into the idea of using a wash with a, a one color, a one color wash, and you'll get essentially the same idea and the same effect. So then how does this work, you know, when we're going into colors? And seeing that we're talking about triads, excuse me, I'm just going to drop some paint on a, uh, on a palette here. And this is what we're talking about, colors or paints. Um, working with a butcher tray, I always do, always have. Um, I think it's, uh, it's really the only, the only way to go. Uh, I know there's a lot of people that like to have the trays with each individual, um, uh, with each individual paint separated. I don't, I've never seen a need for it. I like to put my, my paints right on the butcher tray. Uh, I've got some Windsor Newton Ultramarine, some Windsor Newton Cadmium Yellow. And some Windsor Newton Alizarin Crimson. Uh, it's a pretty basic set of 
primaries, triads, so to speak. Um, so this takes the whole idea of, I guess, some fresh water there. Um, <clears throat> this takes that whole idea of triads back, and I need to clean that brush. Excuse me. Um, this really helps to bring that whole idea of the triads into into play and, and why it's so important. So what we're doing here essentially the same thing that I was doing with the with the gray wash, with the Payne's gray. And back to establishing a, uh, a feel, a, a temperature to the, to the space. This one is gonna be essentially anchored by the yellow. This will be anchored by the alizarin crimson. And once again, remember folks, um, a little sloppy goes a long way. This, once again, this is a sketch. This is not a painting. So, you know, don't, don't be afraid to just Get in there, get it done quick. You know, we aren't creating any kind of a, a masterpiece. These are all parts of helping you make decisions as you move and go into your final piece. Or, you know, when you decide that you've gotten to a place that you feel comfortable or you like. And, uh, What I'm doing is just as I was trying to identify what the values were, that's tantamount to what I'm trying to do right now. I'm just using the colors to delineate different values. And right now, so I've more or less establish my, you know, what my white is going to be. And we can always kick that back a little bit later. And if you could just, oh, thank you. Um, so as you can see, really nothing different here other than this is a, a warm day on the farm. This has got that, like, right before, oh, sunrise kind of a feel. And this has got that blue, hazy day, that wintry touch. Maybe this is even a bit of a wintry touch with that, with that pink sky. So we're going to let this dry for a second. And uh, hopefully it will dry. Fast enough. I'm going to take a little bit of this moisture off of here. Okay. And okay, we're back. Let me know if you want that. So Let's see. So right now, let's see. What are we? Uh, 
we want to talk about. Um, Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so so far, what we've looked at is, you know, just using the pencil as the pencil sketch, pretty normal stuff. Um, looking at just a one color wash. Nice thing about that is it, everything is contained. Uh, nothing's going to go out of get out of hand. You should feel completely comfortable with that. And then we've taken it to, you know, the, you know, what we'll have is a triad, a multicolor wash. And all of these, like I said, are different ways of finding that roadmap, uh, finding your way to that painting. I don't know if this is necessary with every piece that you do, but I, I think it's a really great way to break through break through that barrier to get to the other side just like just like you you know i have my you know my down days i don't know what to do i don't know how to start um i'm frozen you know i walk up and down and up and down this is when this kind of stuff comes in so handy to start looking at your pieces and bring in maybe just let's say let's do it in a one color sketch um, or let's do it in a triad something that is controllable something that you don't really have any fear about you know the last thing you want to do going into any kind of a painting is to be afraid or to be you know shaking oh my gosh what am i going to do uh, of course it takes a lot of thought and planning but this could be a really nice breakthrough for yourself, you know, and we don't have to go into every piece that we do as that final wonderful piece of art. And it's kind of funny too, like even, um, uh, do you have that little sketch that we used? Mm -hmm. um, to, to be honest, um, you know, to be honest, Oh, there we go. Uh, gosh, this mirror. mirror. <laughs> <laughs> this is a sketch. I mean, that's all there is to it. But to be honest, I kind of love it. I mean, there's because there was no boundaries, because there was no rules, <clears throat> because I could basically say I could do anything I want. It's only a sketch. I actually love this piece. I mean, just looking at it when I brought this out from the piles and piles of sketch that I have down in the studio, I said, yeah, I could put a little mat on that. That could be, you know, something, something I would enjoy just looking at it in my kitchen or, you know, even this little eight by eight. So this is kind of the beauty of the sketches that takes away all the pressure of the painting, you know, the, the, I'm doing this. This is going to be my award winner for, you know, Illinois Watercolor Society, or I'm going to, you know, get that out of your head. Do the sketch. Enjoy it. Love it. So, so anyway, we, we've talked about pencils. We've talked about color. We even did the marker with that uh, piece, um, the big rubber ball. Um, one of the things that if, if any of you were here, what was that, November, October, when we did the, the last demo, um, you might remember, you might remember this piece. Okay. And we'll bring this up a little closer, but let's see, to me, I guess. Yes. <laughs> I know, here we are with the mirror again. <laughs> here we are with the mirror. Um, you might remember this piece. This was a demo that we did to show, that I did to show large watercolor painting. And um, uh, I finished it a little bit afterwards because we didn't have enough time, but it came out quite well. But the anatomy of the piece, we can, I think we can just stand that up right there. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this is kind of, this is how it broke down, which, I think it's kind of a 
interesting way to look at. All we gotta do is bring the camera down. And we're right there. Okay. So so this is the original photograph, you know, from the prairie right down the street. And um, as you can see, actually, and this is sketch worthy as well. What I originally planned on for that original demo was this is a center line that actually shows two side by side. These would essentially be four foot by eight foot panels. And that's how I was trying to plan this out with the center line and drove through that. So once again, it's the roadmap, it's the plan. So with that, I went to the Sharpie. Just, this is a, you know, gosh, if it's a two minute drawing, yeah, I'd be surprised. Um, and, uh, but this developed, this gave me the idea of how I want this to, to really come about. Uh, and it just helped me get accustomed to the whole design, the, the idea. And like I said, once again, I was drawn to this by the design factor as much as anything. So I did that and I, I was never, was never totally keen on the whole palette up here. I love the composition and uh, the live experience when I took this photograph, it just seemed to have so much more to it, so much more life. This, you know, as a photograph, this kind of died to me. So I brought this, I brought this shot into Photoshop. And that gave me the opportunity to work with different colors. And I have no qualms about going from from this to this as hand-drawn piece or a photograph, hand-drawn sketch into Photoshop. I think Photoshop, it's it's been a lifesaver for me. I, I've been very comfortable with it throughout my whole life. So it was very easy to go into that. But if you have a, a, a color manipulation program, whether it's Photoshop or something else at home, there's nothing wrong with starting to figure out a different way to look at things. You can bring in different colors and and play around with it. Um, I, it it's a great tool. Um, so once I got to this, that gave me the opportunity to go to this. Now this is only, oh, about a five inch by 18 maybe, 18 inch, 20 inch piece. Mm -hmm. um, but it was comparable in size and, and uh, scale to what the final piece would be. So once I developed this, I was able to, oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. I was able to look at this piece much differently. It, oh, Whoops. thanks. <laughs> um, I got it. I got it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, and as you can see, I, I think it came out fairly striking, you know, much more than it would have um, as the green and the, you know, and the yellows. And it just, it really evoked the feel that I came across on that day, that morning on the prairie when the shadow and the light greeted each other. It was a, just a you know, magnificent morning. And I think this really told the story much better than um, you know, much better than had I painted it, you know, mm -hmm. as a, you know, as it appeared like that. Okay. So, so that's the whole idea right there is, um, whatever, whatever works, you know, once again, whether it's the pencil, the marker, the, the, the wash, the computer, if these are the steps, if these are the roadmaps you need, to get to a final piece, by all means, take them. And it's tremendously valid. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, so uh, let's get back to this real quick. This should be, yeah, that's dry enough. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's take a quick sip. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Let's 
the hand for the assistant. No, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know what you need. Right, thanks. No, no, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Um, so in this case, and this is basically back to that to that color chart again. Ding ding. Um, we've laid down our yellow. Uh, Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to take a little wash of this, this blue. So we're picking up a real nice, a lovely little green tint in there. That's you know one of the beauties of of transparency is that you know you get to you get to mix the colors right in front of you there. So I'm gonna do that in that same respect. We're going to grab a little bit of this yellow, create that beautiful orange sky, actually is what, how that's coming out. And over here, we're going to push the red across. I, I, you know, even to this day, so, you know, what we're seeing is we're using the same colors, but we're getting, you know, that might be a little, a little bright. So just by, you know, using the, here, I'll bring, bring that up a little bit closer. Okay, so so far we've only used two colors and, you know, we've got the, we've created a different atmosphere. We've created a whole different, idea of atmosphere and color just by starting off with one of these colors as the base color, uh, not necessarily as the primary, but as the base color that is influencing the, the scene as a whole. And this is, this, is a, this is what I was saying. What a great way to try to figure out what temperature, what feeling you want to bring to, to that place, to that, to that final painting. This gives you the whole idea of, well, maybe if I start with this and then I, you know, bring that over that, we're going to come back and we're going to, 
you know, we're going to bring the red into this and we're going to bring the blue into this and we're going to bring the yellow into this. And we're using all three of the same color. We're using the three of the same colors on each piece and they're going to be completely different. They're going to be, you know, they're going to give you a completely different feel and atmosphere and statement. Um, it's just, you know, I think, you know, color charts and triads and just working with sketches and going into this world of realizing that you don't need to, once again, complete a painting um, every time you go in there or that maybe a, a step or two before you go into the, that complete painting. Maybe that's the way, you know, it helps to loosen you up. It's, it's just a little break. So um, I've got another, uh, another little demo of computer stuff too, but uh, Barry, any questions? Uh, yeah, there are a couple of questions. Uh, is there a kind of a method to the order in which your uh, in which each color is is painted? Particularly, I think this question refers back to those triads that you were working with. Well, uh, the the method is only that each one of those colors uh, started out as as the base that I overlaid, you know, the next color on top of. Um, and that kind of, uh, uh, I mean, there isn't necessarily a method to the madness other than finding, I mean, this is the madness and then it becomes the method, if, if that makes any sense. Uh, this is telling me what my method is going to be when I move into, you know, a final painting. Uh, uh, and actually even just these make me want to go back down into the studio tomorrow morning and paint a cardboard box <laughs> because it looks so much like, like they could just be beautiful objects to paint. And I think I just may do that. <laughs> I might just do box on top of box. Um, no, someone else is asking, uh, is there a minimum number of colors you would use in your painting? Uh, hardly. Well, I, I have a hard time putting a, a number to that. Um, uh, there, there's a, well, yes, in, in a sense, you know, you could, you could do one painting, you know, I, I think if you use a, a, a paint that has enough value range, uh, a paint gray, a, a sepia, uh, an indigo, something that you can take from almost a, you know, number nine black, dark, you know, darkness to a, you know, to a number two. Um, I love painting in that, you know, it, it's basically, you know, almost like this, because I, I can, you know, get as many values out of that. Uh, I uh, I would never paint in, you know, just a, a yellow or a couple of yellows. I'd never be able to get the, the contrast or the value. Uh, I think that's, uh, other than the color, and that's, you know, what we've been talking about a lot, uh, probably, you know, the most important in my mind is, uh, is value. And you have to establish, you know, a strong value contrast to make that make that work pop. And th that took a while for me to to understand. It was actually even uh, in my commercial art period. So I had a client that kept on coming back to me with this product design or package design that he wanted to pop. And I, I was like, pop? How do I pop? How do I pop? Until it, it was really it just became. It's value. That's all he was asking for. They were just asking for contrast, and and you know that gives it the pop. We were on a Zoom call a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was the National Watercolor Society. It was really really 
very enlightening because the past president was the moderator or the, the guest. And it was all about getting into exhibitions. And the big question was, okay, so what is it? What makes you choose this one over the other? And his response was that it has to pop. If I can walk into a gallery, if I can walk into a room and I look across the room, I see that painting that just draws me, makes me walk over there. Uh, that's the one I, I always go to first. And uh, that makes, makes a lot of sense. It really does. So um, minimum amount of painting, uh, of paints, um, colors, um, working with a, you know, you know, you look at some, you know, you get a, a sepia or a, a burnt umber working with cobalt, you know, I mean, that alone is just magnificent because the two have such wonderful granulation when they come together. It, it's almost like you don't even need to paint. You just put the two pieces together, the two elements together, and it creates stuff right in front of your eyes. It's, yeah, it's great. Um, but uh, there probably is a limit to the maximum I, I would paint with. Uh, I mean, you can't, I don't think you can paint with all colors of the rainbow. Um, but I will, you know, we'll use a whole group of blues, but then, you know, back to that dot of orange, um, you know, if I want to throw a nice complimentary dash in there, uh, that, that always seems to work, you know. It's kind of like, yeah, I got that one. Yeah. <laughs> this is going out the door. <laughs> Great. Not that we're all painting to send things out the door. Yeah, but it just, it sometimes those work. Um, so uh, let's see. How we and do Just oh. another question, a little bit more about the process. Um, do you ever use a hairdryer? Uh, to dry the paint in between stages, like with what you're doing tonight. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I hate to rush through things, but I, I also wanted to be kind to your uh, to the viewers out there. I didn't want them to see see me with my back to the camera with a hair dryer going going crazy back and forth, and and, and that's one of the reasons I, I try. I've been trying to tailor this whole presentation to that idea. Um, uh, in, a, in a live demo, I'll do it plenty. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll use that because I can talk, we can interact. Um, the standing joke I use is, it's like watching paint dry, about, <laughs> about as exciting. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah, of course I use a, I, I'll use that. Um, and it, it depends too. It, when I'm working, uh, when I'm working really large, uh, and like I said, you know, like you mentioned, some of these pieces, you know, can be eight foot, twelve feet, twenty feet. Um, there's not a hair dryer in the world that's going to help. <laughs> so, so it's a it's a bucket of water, and you know, we paint and go away for a day. You know, maybe put a fan on, a couple of fans and a heater uh, to get back to it next morning. Um, but that, that's about it. But yeah, I, I always use a, a dryer. Mm -hmm. And maybe just one more, one more question uh, oh, okay. about terminology. Would you call what you're doing there in the sketches, would you call that uh, painting wet on wet? Well, I, I am to a degree. Um, but no, I wouldn't necessarily call this wet on wet. I mean, it's it's more wet on damp, <laughs> and only because I'm trying to get through it, and I don't want to go through the whole hair dry experience. Um, I mean, wet on wet is um, And we'll just, it, in my mind, I think what on what, where my oh, here. paints go? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. That's all right. 
I mean, there's that's wet, and then wet on wet is is what on what is just that it's what on what and that's going to go where it goes now in a lot of the grass and the more abstract pieces i do this is a very traditional way for me to start because this is these are the things i love about um about watercolor is that they do do all these types of things but if i'm working on a sketch um that's probably it's probably not going to happen see there's this is a lot more spontaneous uh this is something i can't plan i can i can put blue down here 10 times in a row and i can put red on top of it and I'm not going to get exactly that. And I'm going to wipe that so it doesn't ruin the rest of my board. Um, so that would be more of a. Oh, you want to go this way? Okay. Yeah, let's go that way. Okay. <laughs> um, that would be more of a wet on wet. So what we'll do here is um, where. I'm going to go back in here. And once again, remember, I'm just using this to explore the triads and um, so this is my light, this is my second value. how this works and we have uh, yellow and red over there so yeah just kind of similar and drop in the blue And once again, you know, the whole point being here is that uh, each one of these are being painted with the exact same palette. Um, and I'm getting absolutely 100% different results. And this is going to help you understand, you know, now we've, we've went beyond just understanding value, but it's going to help you understand how your color choices can work. Thank you. Um, when you're painting the barn or when you're painting the box. And and this, I think this is invaluable when you, when you look at how you're going to approach that journey that you're taking or that, that painting that you're, you're going, you know, there's a, obviously you're working on a triad. There's three separate ways to create an atmosphere, three different atmospheres. And by doing this, you're going to lay down the you're going to start laying down the reasoning that it's the, the,
the madness is out of the method now. Now you're saying, okay, well, if I start like this on this nice little 10 by 10 piece, okay, I can start like this. I didn't waste a whole, you know, half sheet of, you know, Arches 300 pound watercolor paper, or, you know, I didn't just spend $50 on paint to go nowhere. At least I have a starting point. And these are the kind of things I think that are so important. Um, and it's also the thing, it's, it's also the thing that, once again, takes that, takes that fear out. And it's so important to, to, I believe, now there's a lot of different types of watercolor artists, you know, but I come from a, a school of a fairly loose, you know, technique. Um, it can get pretty tight, you know, as tight as you want it to get. But I stay in that kind of loose moment. As a matter of fact, my my instructor uh, uh, Shapiro would say, "Ireland, you're uh, you're kind of kind of loose. You're a little too loose sometimes. You know, you need to tighten it up." Uh, that's something I never really pushed on too hard. Usually, it's just the opposite with most most painters that begin in that uh, in that world. They're, everybody's real tight. They're trying to do things, but this gives you the opportunity to not care, to stay loose, keep that arm open. You know, you want to you want to stay you want to stay out here, and you know, you just have so much more control. You can see what you're doing as opposed to you don't want to be in here and do this kind of stuff, you know, besides going blind, it's no fun. It really is a lot more fun to just, you know, shoot from three point line than, you know, have to go up against the board all the time. So that was a strange analogy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, where are we? We're at, uh, Oh, about are we close to eight o'clock? Oh, getting there. Okay. Um, Here we take that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so um, I may come back in here and just pick up a couple of these and you know just go in with a with a real nice dark value, but we're gonna let that that dry for a sec. I'll just keep that flat over there. Um, you want to mm -hmm. grab that for me? I hope you're all having fun here tonight. <laughs> uh, I'm having a very nice time. I wish we were all together and, you know, this would be a lot more fun if we could uh, be clinking a glass of wine together and laughing back and <laughs> forth. Um, but, uh, but we can't. <laughs> so we're here. So this is kind of a, uh, uh, this is, what is a painting? Uh, let me straighten that out there. Uh, what is a painting? A painting. What is a painting? A sketch. You know, by, you know, by all means, this could be, you know, I could easily put this up into a frame and, you know, actually I do have a signature on it already. Um, but this actually in itself is a sketch. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the the issue was, and let me come back into the frame for a second. the The issue was a uh, a consultant had. Thank you. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, the consultant uh, I was working with out in San Diego has a sixteen foot wall, nine foot, 16 across, 16 foot, feet across, and nine feet tall, yes. something like that. Uh -huh. um, and I had to work on a proposal for that. Uh, it's still actually in the works. But um, I started working on paper. I'm going to just come up here a little bit and get back in, in the screen. Yeah, let me hold this for Thanks. you. Um, I was working on paper and, and doing a number of sketches, but then as I worked more and more, I realized that at that size, I would never be able to work on, on paper, uh, no matter how large the paper was, because besides 
getting the large paper, there's the mounting the paper and keeping an archival. So I realized I had to go to an aqua board or to some kind of masonite panel, which led me to this. But uh, I'd never painted something as uh, narrative or as objective as this at that size. A lot of the stuff was the more abstract grasses. I knew I could just wash color all over the place, but to come up with something very identifiable, I knew I had to go to a uh, uh, to an aqua board that uh, would be substantial. So, <clears throat> with that said, and I'm just going to change this out for a second. That being a sketch. it actually became another sketch. And let me get out of the way here. So here we are, um, a 19 foot wall. Uh, so that original painting then, once again, I told you that uh, there's no rules in sketching. Yeah. We, I brought this into Photoshop, took their plans, and then created <clears throat> various panels that were, you know, varying from six foot high to eight foot high. And then that way I could take that into, you know, the Photoshop, show them how it would look, framed on a drop shadow, you know, behind the wall. I think there's a, uh, uh, yeah, there's a whole, a whole doorway. There it is. Um, and there's some funky stuff going on with the virtual background, but you can get the get the idea. So this is in the process right now. Um, and once I was able to take it to the um, aqua board at that size and use the pencil and use the, the paint, it gave me the confidence to say, yes, I can create a piece that is going to be, you know, essentially eight feet tall and how many feet across? 16 feet, I think was the final. Um, so once again, another way to look at sketching. Uh, so I will bring us back home to Carrie. And here we are, <laughs> and we're back. So um, what I'm going to do is wrap up, uh, I'm going to throw a couple of darks and just have at it on these couple of pieces. Uh, any questions right now, you're more than welcome just to jump in while I finish this up. And um, what was it, about 8 o'clock. Anybody that would like to stick around, I'm going to finish this up in just a couple of minutes. Anybody that like to, would like to stick around, um, we're actually not in my studio at the moment. We're in my in my gallery, which we we built uh, just so happens about a year ago. Uh, which about oh, it was the week of COVID. It was well, yeah, and, <laughs> and the week life. after week <laughs> after we built the gallery, uh, we closed it. Uh, so uh, not very many people have come to see this. So it's not all that large, but uh, after I do a couple of tweaks on that, I'd love for anybody to, uh, you know, feel free to keep asking questions, but we're gonna give you a kind of a, a tour around. We've got the iMac on a Lazy Susan, so we can give you the full 360. <laughs> and uh, what do you think in there, uh, Barry? Well, you know, you can you can take your time. We, we have plenty of, of time to ask a couple of questions. Uh, some people had some questions about some of your larger pieces, if we can go that direction a little bit. Uh, someone is asking, do you buy your watercolor paper on rolls to get the sizes you work with? And I think you mentioned using some type of board instead. Maybe you could clarify that. Sure. Um... Yes, I, I buy rolls uh, for the very large, and, and actually we've got a piece uh, right behind uh, uh, right behind the camera 
that's about 90 inches long and about 35, maybe three feet tall. Mm -hmm. um, that is uh, uh, arches, I think it's 140 pound arches. It comes in rolls of 56 feet by, no, yeah, something 56 by 48 inches high. Um, I, so, and, which is a, <laughs> one day we'll have a, a stretching demo because stretching a, a, a sheet of uh, watercolor paper at 90 inches across and, and four feet uh, high is uh, kind of fun, kind of crazy. Um, I also use pretty regularly, I love using arches, 300 pound watercolor paper. That's one of my go-tos. Uh, when I do a large piece like that, it's usually on the full 40 by 60 inch piece. Um, the panels that I use are uh, all produced by, uh, by Ampersand. They're out of Austin, Texas, uh, and they come in four foot by eight foot sheets. Um, usually when I'm working on pieces like that, um, I'll order, you know, 10 to 20 at a time. And they just, they come in on a old Dominion, you know, semi truck and there's a, a forklift that brings them all into the garage. And, you know, I slip the driver at 20 and off we go. Uh, so, yeah. And then actually when they start, when I start moving into like the, the larger pieces, 16 foot wide or 20 foot wide, um, I'll butt the two pieces together in the studio and, and paint. We, I have a woodworker um, partner that trims them down for me so we get a really nice smooth edge and we butt them in. He'll create a, uh, a specific frame for him that has uh, uh, steel supports in them so there's no buckling or no warping. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's Ampersand is my pretty much my go-to for all my panels. Uh, I love their their aqua board. Uh, their pastel board is just crazy beautiful. Uh, I mean, obviously it's great for for uh, for pastels, but the thing about their pastel board, it's and you could probably buy some at Blitz at a smaller size. Keep keep an eye out for it or any any art supply store. Uh, you put a, a splash of paint on it, and it just like it blossoms like crazy. It, it it just runs and goes, and but it doesn't run. It's just like like a flower opening, you know. So and I actually have a couple of pieces up on the wall that I'll show you. They're and they're good size. They're about what forty eight by forty eight. No, those are 40 by 40. 40 by 40s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so let me finish this up and I'll, I'll show you some of those uh, large pieces of, of paper that we're using. And yeah, we got to do that too. Um, so we've used all three colors on these. Uh, but I'm just going to go in now with. Um, some darks and. Now I'm actually going to mix the paints. I'm not, I'm using the triad. Actually, I'm not sure if I even like where that's going. So I'm not going to do that. That just turned, that just turned to mud. That, that's the one thing that you need to be careful with, with triads. Thank you. Um, is when you, I'll just do this right up here. When you mix them all together, there's your blue, there's your yellow, there's your, there's your red, or crimson. And try to get some equal amounts. Um, you can you can go they they call it mud but it's really 
It's really gray. I mean, it's it's actually actually a beautiful way to create a gray when you when you mix your triads together. You can see it coming out right there. Um, and um, like I said, most people, at least growing up, I was always told, well, you know, now you're mixing mud, but it's really just a beautiful, a beautiful gray with an undertone of, you know, that of all three colors that really just make it, make it snap. So um, I take that back. I, I think, I think there are some nice things happening there. Um, but as I was saying before, why not do this here at this size, then do it on a big sheet of, you know, $30, $50 paper, you know, why, why even go there? I, you know, this is, this is where you want to just be able to do this and, and then you don't cry yourself to sleep at night mm -hmm. saying, oh my God, I just wasted all that paper. Um, so I think we'll, we'll leave it at that. But you can see that actually worked out pretty well. And that was, you know, you know that, that did right there. That gave me that roadmap that, you know, I was looking for. Because now I know I can go into this and, um, you know, I, I have a fighting chance, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Uh, so, so there you go. It's... Uh, Go out there and you know, be free. So, um, so if you'd like to keep on firing any questions away, please do. Um, sure, and and we did want to take a look at the studio, uh, but I will uh, go ahead and and read some of these questions out loud. Uh, let's go back to uh, how do you adhere your watercolors. Uh, if I think the question is, if you are painting it on paper, how do you adhere it to the board? And then some. The question continues, like before you varnish, and what kind of varnish do you use? Sure. Um, well, a traditional size paper. Let's say it's a thirty by forty, or even a forty by. <clears throat> like. I guess it depends on the on the weight of the paper. I, I never paint on anything less than 140 pounds. If it's um, a reasonable size of 140 pound, let's say 20 by 30, uh, uh, that can be, as far as I, I'm concerned, that could be just taped down with good masking tape, um, similar to a 40 by 60, you know, 300 pounds, any 300 pound, that doesn't require any stretching or anything else like that. Um, working on like, uh, well, here, I, I'll tell you what, here's, I, I am going to show you the, the gallery because, okay. because this is the best way to explain it. Um, I'm going to take this down. And we're going to, we're just going to come around here. Um, And we'll take it to the to the toughest stretch ever. Um, this is yeah, well, it okay. So this is a big piece of watercolor paper. Okay. And how far? How big is? Well, no, you got to go that oh, way. I, gotta, I have to go this way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's even bigger. Okay. There we go. So yeah, this is this is uh, over ninety inches. I think it's hundred and ten actually. Um, it's a whopper. If you closer. if you huh? bring it closer, maybe it's like C. Yeah. It's okay to go. You walk no. You walk your way in. Walk that way. There we go. No, okay. So uh, this is actually. This was rolled out, cut up, and originally probably a couple inches larger on either side. Actually, you can see some of the 
some of the tape marks there, but this whole thing was was, was, stapled. was stapled. Yeah, so uh, I took this. I, I took that into a. Sorry about that. That's all right. I took that into a huge. Um, actually, I took it into my jacuzzi outside on the deck. <laughs> the big roll soaked the whole thing, brought it down, big whoppy mess, and on top of a. Uh, well, it had to be. Let's see. I guess it, I guess it was an eight foot because it would have been gator board. Stretch it over gator board with sponges. We stretch it out, stretch it out, stretch it out. Wrapped it underneath and stapled, just like you would stretch canvas. Um, and that probably took, gosh, good forty eight hours to dry. And if you've ever stretched paper like that before, the most exciting thing is come, coming down and um, uh, hearing that little drum sound, knowing that it's so tight. Um, other pieces like this would be, let's see, this would be upside down. Mm -hmm. This one's a favorite of mine. I love this. Yeah. So back to me, I guess. Yep. Right so, so this is a full sheet of 40 by 60, 300 pound Arches watercolor paper. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, because I don't see any, I don't see any staples. No, this is not staples. No. So, so this was just laid out on a huge piece of gator board once again and taped down with multiple layers on the outside of uh you know basically art masking tape um you know so that's that's you know that's real like uh, it's so nice to work with because it's so such less of a hassle the other one um that was yeah you know, that was required to go that size um that first one that we showed you, that very long 90 inch piece, um, that painting was not actually commissioned as an original painting. That painting was co uh, commissioned to be a print, which actually turned out to be a, a, a wall covering at the NICU Center in Children's. NICU at Dallas Children's uh, yeah. Memorial Hospital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. at, uh, yeah, so we actually ended up keeping the the original, but uh, we sold the uh, the print as a uh, uh, as a wall covering. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, well here. Wait a minute, hon. Okay. It's not gonna. Well, I, I can... we'll have to pick it up. So... Well, here I can just bring this over. Oh, okay. Here I can help you. Sure. This is aqua board, and this is a forty-eight by forty-eight. So it's you know it's a real live, honest to goodness board. The beauty about this now is there's no stretching, there's no taping down, there's no nothing. You know this basically becomes a surface in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, so this is yeah. essentially about a half sheet. Because the full sheet, we've got a, we've got an eight foot back there, but I'm not going to pull that out at the moment. Um, and then, we good? Yep, we're good. And then we're even up here, these are. If you want to take, okay, sure. Well, well, those are opera boards as well that we just uh, cut. I think they're about four foot high, and cut out of a. Uh, Probably a, a ninety-six inch piece, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so that's that's the best way to show you. I think um, you want to show show those. Yeah, let me take this light down a little bit. Let me just do this real quick. So, and how do you finish or protect your paintings uh, with varnish or glass or? Well, uh, the beauty of the 
of the panels is that I can varnish those and and these can be without glass. And, and I think that's been one of the keys to some of the success that we've had in some of the institutional commissions is that we can do this without glass. Uh, the, and then, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, go ahead. You can see these up at the top, which I'm trying to tilt this a little bit more. Those are all on aquaboard as well, and they're sitting in a floater frame. So they're lifted a little bit and then set inside the frame. So that's what those look like. There's another one over there. That's, oh, and then you've got this one, okay. Then in a more traditional, what? Here, I'll lift, I'll help you lift no, it up. That's all right. It's, well, you can't see the bottom. Okay. More of a traditional framing. This is approximately a 40 by 60 with, with plexiglass, you know, the matte frame, you know, more or less a traditional piece, you know, traditional painting, the, the barn on the sloping hill type of thing. Um, as, as these are in the back as well. Right. So. You want to just lean it against here? Yeah, we can just yeah. put this down. Okay. And so someone is asking, when you do varnish, what type of varnish do you use? Uh, almost primarily uh, golden varnish. Uh, there's two different kinds that I'll use. One is a spray, um, a spray varnish, which is a, a solvent. Uh, it's pretty toxic. It's one of those kind of things that you better have a industrial respirator <laughs> gas mask or not gas mask, but yeah, uh, gas face, mask. face mask uh, to use. And I try to do that outside or outside in the you know, uh, workshop outside. But there's also a golden varnish uh, polymer, which uh, is water soluble. So I can use that inside and you, you could either brush that on. I actually with that, a lot of times I'll use like a foam, uh, foam roller. Uh, in either case, either one of those processes, I usually put uh, up to at least seven coats of varnish on every painting that goes, that goes out of the house. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's just uh, the beauty of either one of these. Well, I'll almost always use a gloss varnish. The beauty of the gloss varnish is that it uh, intensifies the not it, it intensifies the color, but it just makes it just a little bit darker. And if any of you paint in watercolor, you know that that first time when you put the color down and it's still a little wet and it glistens, and then you come back. Oh, about a half hour, 45 minutes later, all of a sudden, it's just a little less intense. It's like, oh, shoot. Uh, when you're all finished and it's all dry and you put the gloss varnish back on, it actually, boom, the whole thing just jumps. It's like back to when it was wet on paper and it's just gorgeous. Um, something to be careful of is that when you use the mat, it goes just the opposite. Everything dulls down and it loses color. Uh, but there's a good reason to use matte at different times too. So, you know, it's one of those kind of things that you need to uh, uh, experiment with. Here's a pretty interesting, uh, uh, my favorite piece. Oh, yeah, I'm going to show that one too. Uh, along. Well, that, th this is just uh, that orange piece is on paper. Uh, that's rocks, uh, rock river bed. This was actually in the uh, Elmhurst Artist Guild uh, member show. It just came down last week. And I've got a new piece in there, by the way, for the spring show. Um, and then, this one's hard to tell the scope. There's the dog in the chair, but <laughs> yeah, we, we have our we have our Wyeth dog. <laughs> Say hello. 
Yeah, this always... one's hard to see the, the scope because it can't go up as high. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a, this is a grouping of, it's actually made up of two eight foot by four foot panels and each one. Of, so there's, there's about, I guess there's eight panels here mm -hmm. and they're all lifted off and relieved off of each other. Um, it's called old growth, new growth. And uh, these are all panels that are, you know, finished with varnish, uh, UV, UV resistant, moisture, you know, resistant. Uh, so I mean, they're, you know, they're as good as being under glass. Uh, and you can see that, you know, it even gives you the opportunity to do some sculptural type pieces. You can see them. Mm -hmm. Sure, or, or even, even yeah. over there too. Yeah, we've got, um, there's a sculpture one right there. And yeah, see, see being that these are panels, um, they actually become very similar to you know, any construction material. These are four foot by eight foot panels of masonite, uh, no different from plywood. So, you know, they could become you know, a structural material. Yeah, in this regard, I don't can, uh, there. See that? Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, it's a. It's a three sixty. Essentially, it's a watercolor sculpture. Great, thank you. Um, someone is asking. Uh, and maybe it's clarification about the varnish, but does the varnish eventually dull the painting? Uh, it hasn't yet. <laughs> what should I say? I've been using it for 20 years. I, I visited a painting that we installed um, maybe 12, 13 years ago, and uh, it looked pretty close to... Mm -hmm pretty close to brand new. Uh, so it doesn't, uh, eventually you, you haven't had trouble with it crackling either then? Absolutely not. Now, you know, too, um, that could depend on, I'm not gonna vouch for the manufacturer, especially. I mean, you'd have to talk to Golden Colors on something like that. Um, could it crackle if maybe you applied it incorrectly or you know, you left moisture underneath it when you were applying or any other, but I, you know, I haven't had really any questions, issues. Um, Mary and I have been very fortunate over the last, uh, you know, 15 years, we've been able to place these types of larger pieces varnished in, you know, facilities pretty country. much across the country. So um, I'm sure I'd hear <laughs> I'm sure I hear from somebody. Uh, yeah, uh, like anything, though, it has to be taken care of, like especially a piece of art. Uh, these are theoretically they're UV resistant. Would I put them in direct sunlight in some atrium lobby? I'd probably at least ask the client to sign a waiver. You know, I or not. I mean, I don't know. I mean, buyer beware. <laughs> right, so, um, can you can you talk a little bit about the variety of of subjects because we've seen some abstract pieces and some more natural pieces um some inanimate objects can you talk about your choices in subject matter sure thank you i'd, I'd love to um i started out as a very traditional painter of in, in watercolor, uh, I've painted more barns than, you know, anybody except for maybe Dale Popovich. <laughs> That's a joke. Hi, Dale, if you're out there. Um, and I, I stayed with that for a long time. Uh, my Most of my work or a lot of the work that really took off was the prairie grasses. And, you know, that is still at the in my heart, I love to do that. It provides me with, with joy to paint and it's freedom and everything else like that. But back to the sketching, uh, 
I love to draw. I love to uh, discover shape, value, and I'm a big fan of negative space. Uh, so, yeah, a piece like this, uh, this only came out of, you know, my, my quest to look at something different and, and get outside of the box of everything else. I mean, there's different things that go on here that I'm trying to achieve from value, especially negative, positive space um, and, and value. And, and so almost everything I do, um, especially if I'm doing it for myself, is an exploration of just getting down to some of those very basic ideas of value, shape, and um, you know, complementary or colors that work together. So um, how that comes about exactly, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, I have a lot of narrative work that uh, you know stays within a certain circle of people. Uh, I've I have a whole series of work that uh, is focused on tools, a lot of hand tools from hammers and rakes and shovels and things like that. R very near to me because I, I love just working on that particular, you know, observational idea and, and trying to, you know, bring that to life. But, you know, I've, I've got a set of collectors that are gravitated to that. And I don't paint to one or another uh, collector. I, I paint for myself and it turns out that some groups of people are drawn to that as opposed to others. Um, I was, I was shot. I, I was pleasantly surprised. I picked up a. I keep all my old American artists. I, I picked up a, an American artist magazine from 2002, not too long ago. It was Mondrian, you know, the guy that does all the squares and the shapes and the you know beautiful, you know, design work that he's known for. But this discussed his uh, landscape work which was, it, it kind of blew me away because I never really equated him with landscape work. And his comment was that he sees no difference between the two. They're, they're both doing what he's been, what he's trying to do. And, you know, they're both, you know, the, um, as far as he was concerned, there was no difference. And when I look at, at this and I look at my prairie, to me, I'm just trying to achieve the same thing. It seems to me it's the same, same process, the same idea that I'm trying to get through. I mean, I can get a little more, you know, out there ethereal about space and time and shape with this, and it seems to make sense. But I also, you know, I also can look at my prairies and find that same metaphor or same story that goes in there. So. Back to your process a little bit. Uh, do you have a favorite type of brush that you use? I, I have a couple of favorite brushes. Um, uh, this is a silver black velvet. I think I'm pretty sure it's a Simmons. This is, uh, well, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I've been painting for 50 years. <laughs> but I've had this for uh, probably 40 years and you can see it's all taped up and everything else like that. It's been around forever. Um, this is a very favorite brush of mine. It's a, it's a sky wash. This is a Robert Simmons. Um, I also have a couple of very large uh, brushes that I found through Liquitex, which are... Um, yeah, if you want to, um, which are, I, I think one's an eight inch brush, eight inch wide. And another is um, uh, maybe five or six. Mary's gonna run down to the studio to, to grab them. Uh, they're monsters, especially when it comes to, uh, to watercolor. But you're gonna find if you take the opportunity to paint on a sheet that's uh, eight foot wide, you need something a little bit bigger. Um, 
but I can be fairly non-traditional as well. I mean, there's a couple of times I've even picked up, you know, brooms and, you know, wiped, you know, I mean, basically swept paint across. What uh, happened to the Oh, the no, no, I, I have the other. There, there's another one that I do have the handle. Uh, the handle's gone. The handle's gone. Um, but, but yeah, this is a, uh, it's a Liquitex Freestyle. Okay, see that? Um, which is, you know, what, what is this? Eight, this is eight inch. So, I mean, I can get a fairly, fairly large um, swath of this. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. The reason this is so important is that, okay, so if I am working, here, let me hold that. Hold the big one for a second. Okay. If I am working on a piece that is this size and I do a sketch that's this and I use this and I like the way this stroke works, well, if I'm moving up to a piece that's twice this size, well, relatively, this to an eight foot board is what that brush was to that. So we didn't talk a lot about painting large, but that's the whole thing that you have to realize when you're going large is that, I uh, get that brush. Mm -hmm. um, that's what you have to realize is that everything's relative. Yeah which um, takes us back to space, time, shape, negative, positive, everything's relative. And that's the way you need to plan. And that's why you even look at your sketches because, you know, it's all relative. Mm -hmm. Have you kept a catalog of all of your sold works? <laughs> We try very hard. Um, I, I think something we, I'm trying to put together right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm laughing. We, we have a pretty good, we have a pretty good uh, pictorial inventory going back about twelve years. Um, probably more than that. Maybe more than that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, uh, but there's, there are a number of pieces when I first started out that we didn't realize the importance of cataloging. Um, cause I eventually had friends or other or clients even, you know, send a photo and say, Hey, this, uh, yeah, I want you to see this. It's still in our house. And I'm like, Oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> or I do remember that, but, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I know. so, uh, <laughs> we have, we have a pretty strong inventory <laughs> list though. Yeah, oh yeah. Perhaps to finish up, uh, do you have any uh, artists that you particularly admire or emulate? Any favorites? Oh gosh, gosh. Um, there, there's. I mean, I could I could go on forever. Uh, I mean, I, I have contemporaries, you know, that I I just love. Um, I mean, there's there's local people, you know, from uh, you know Becker to Popovich to Danielson to you know Tony uh, Armendias, uh, who I I love. Nancy Nancy K. Mertz, Frankie Johnson. I mean, the, the locals, the, there's so much great, so many great painters around, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple, you know, the, you know, going into the sergeants and the homers, and, and of course, you know, the man dearest to my heart, you know, Shapiro, who I, who I, you know, uh, just was on as I, you know, sat by his side watching him. Uh, so, um, yeah, it, it, and it's, it's uh, it, yeah, uh, Pollock, I mean, my God, when, when I, I never painted like I painted when I started painting the, uh, the prairies, and I never understood Pollock. I, I thought he was pretty cool, but I never understood what the heck he was doing. And even though my paintings aren't, my prairies aren't Pollock, 
they became just a matter of, you know, you know, have at it. And I, that was a moment that I was like, wow, I, I think I, I think I kind of get what he was doing. Um, that's, you know, that might be too, you know, maybe I don't. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, but uh, anybody who paints, number one, I admire. And, and that's from novice to professional. If they approach it in, you know, you know a serious way or the, the way that makes it work, um, you know, I've, I contend that, you know, this is not art. This is, this is artwork. It's a work of art. Art is the process of doing. So if you're doing something, then that's art. And it doesn't matter the good, the bad, you know, it's like, it's like dancing, you know, uh, you can't, you can't buy a dance. You know, you can you can watch a dance, you can videotape a dance, but until you're a dancer, until you dance around the room, whether it's good or bad, thank you. Um, it, uh, yeah. So that's what art is. Art is doing. And, um, yeah. So, uh, thank you. I don't know if, uh, as we finish up here, I don't know if there's any final thoughts or anything I wanted to be sure to say before we wrap it up tonight. Okay. Well, well thanks. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, have a couple of, uh, selfish plugs here. <laughs> uh, one is, uh, thank you for mentioning the, the Hudson Valley Art Association. Um, uh, that's pretty big to me. I mean, that's, I kind of feel like I'm uh, walking in the, in the shadow of some giants there. Uh, and I'm very humbled to, to be a part of that uh, exhibition. Uh, and that's uh, in uh, Old Lyme, Connecticut, uh, May 22nd, that opens up. Um, I'm also at, uh, I've got a piece that's kind of a cousin to this one. Uh, over at the Elmhurst Art Museum in the spring uh, members show that I'm really happy with. Uh, uh, it actually traveled over from Oak Park Art League uh, where it picked up an honorable mention over there. Uh, and it just so happened I had it available for that. So it's over at uh, Elmhurst Art Guild. Um, the gallery opening, uh, hope, hopefully we're, you know, we're, 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 we're there and, you know, we're opening up and uh, July is our target date. Uh, we're going to put a scheduling app on the website. So uh, take a look uh, and hopefully, you know, if you'd like to come out, we'd love to have you. We'll even do a Zoom gallery tour if you'd like. But absolutely. Uh, yeah. But keep an eye on that. Uh, please sign up for our email on our email list and we can keep you, you know, posted on, on what's going on. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So. Well, thank you so very much. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. One last thing. If you're up in Door County, I just dropped off uh, three pretty tr traditional pieces up at Fine Line Gallery just uh, in uh, north of Fish Creek. Great, great. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly want to thank Michael and Mary for generously giving your time and effort to provide this presentation coordinated with the DuPage Art League. And I will be sending out the link to their website as well as an email address so that you can explore uh, the work more and contact them. If you're watching this program, if you're watching the recording of this program and you would like those links, please email me at ce at wheatonlibrary.org. That's ce for community engagement. And I would be happy to send those links out to you. The recording of this program will be available on the library's YouTube page within about a week. So with that, uh, we say thank you again to everyone who tuned in tonight. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. And uh, we hope to see everyone again very soon. Uh, take care, everyone. Good night.